Hello and welcome back. So today I want to continue talking about driving transistors in parallel and in particular I want to look at MOSFET type transistors. Now this sort of transistor has certain particularities which are different than the bipolar junction transistor that I looked at last time so go check that out if you haven't seen it already. And also MOSFETs have two main applications. On the one side you have linear amplifiers where your output signal needs to be proportional to the input signal and also you have switching applications. Basic things like turning a load on or off or in switching converters. And these two use cases need to be treated slightly separately. So if you're curious how you can drive multiple MOSFETs in parallels in these two separate applications and how to get them all to work nicely and evenly and without too many oscillations, then keep watching. So let's start things off by remembering how the MOSFET transistor works. Now unlike the bipolar transistor, the MOSFET is a voltage driven device. So your drain current will depend on the gate voltage. To get a clearer understanding, let's look at the datasheet. So what I got here is the datasheet for a small signal MOSFET, the 2N7000. I'll be using this in my experiments. And now one of the graphs that we have here is this one. So here you can see what sort of drain current we should be expecting depending on the applied gate source voltage and the drain source voltage. Now to see this graph a bit clearer, I prepared this thing. Now in the graph we have two distinct regions. We've got a region in which drain current is increasing at a certain slope and here it depends on two factors on the gate source voltage but also the drain source voltage and this is called the linear region and then on the right side we have our saturation region where the drain current only depends on the gate source voltage. Now the naming is a bit confusing, usually you, saturation is when you have a very small voltage drop on the transistor and linear the other way, but it doesn't matter. I didn't come up with the names. Now the two regions have their distinct formulas, so how to figure out what sort of current you'll be getting. And the interface between the two happens roughly at the point where your drain source voltage will be equal to your gate source minus the threshold voltage. So for example, if we have a drain source voltage of seven volts and the threshold is about three volts for this transistor, then this interface point is roughly at about four volts. So th this is an approximate point. It's not exactly there, but just to get an idea. Now there's two more parameters in these formulas that we need to talk about. And that is the threshold voltage and the scale factor. Now the threshold voltage is basically the voltage above which the transistor starts to work and the scale factor just sets its transconductance. Now both these parameters depend highly on the way in which the transistor is built, so its physical characteristics, but they also depend on temperature. Now for the threshold voltage we actually have it in our datasheet and this can have values between 0.8 and 3 volts, so this has a very large spread, so you can have completely different voltages at which one transistor starts to conduct compared to another transistor. But the threshold voltage is also temperature dependent. So we have this nice graph here in our datasheet where we can see exactly what threshold voltage you should be getting depending on temperature. So this is a normalized threshold voltage, meaning that the one value corresponds to the actual voltage you actually have on your particular transistor. And we can see that this threshold voltage drops with temperature increase. So the hotter the transistor gets, the lower the voltage at which it starts to work. So we have a positive feedback mechanism. Let's look at this parameter in a bit more detail on a practical board. And for that, I prepared this setup right here. So what I have here is my 10 volt power supply supplying my circuit. I have a board with three transistors and all of their gates are interconnected to a trimming potentiometer. So with this I will be able to set various gate voltage values and I'm measuring this with my first voltmeter. 
Now, the free transistors have a 10 ohm resistor in their drains, and I'm measuring the voltage drop on them using the other free voltmeters, so we can see what current is going through the circuit. And to prevent the transistors from destroying themselves, the free resistors are not supplied directly from 10 volts, but rather from 5 volts, and I'm decreasing this voltage using an active voltage load. So this is a circuit that I've built a while back in an older video, so you can check that out if you're curious. But the point is, my trimming potentiometer can take 10 volts, but my transistors and resistors only 5. So let's start things off. As you can see, 0 gate voltage, 0 drain current, as expected. But now if I start to increase the voltage, So at 800 millivolts, nothing. The threshold voltage of all of the transistors is larger than 800. Now if I increase a bit more, it's supposed to be below 3. And finally, at about 1.9 something volts, we see our first transistor starts to conduct. So we have one milliamp going through this transistor and still nothing through the other ones. Now, if I increase just a bit more at 2.09, we can see the first transistor already has four to five milliamps. The second transistor has one milliamp and the third transistor still has nothing. And if I increase just a bit more, At around 2.20, we see the first milliamp appearing on our third transistor. So because of the spread in the threshold voltage, one transistor is already at 12 milliamps, where the other one is at only one. And of course, this can become far, far worse. So let me just increase the currents a bit. So now we're roughly at 2.7 volts in the gate. 92 milliamps, 44, 45. And now if we let the circuit run for a while, we can see that the drain currents slowly start to increase. So based on how the transistors are heating up, their threshold voltage is decreasing, so we can get more current through them. Of course, to enhance the effect, we can heat up one of the transistors. So I have my soldering iron, and if I go for the middle transistor, we can see its current quickly increasing. So as it heats up, we have a sharp rise in current. So we can see that our threshold voltage is temperature dependent. The hotter the transistor gets, the lower the threshold voltage, so higher the drain current. But now, if we turn back to the formulas, other than the threshold voltage, we also had the scale factor. And this is also temperature dependent. And just like the threshold voltage, with increasing temperature, we start to decrease this parameter, which leads to a decrease in drain current. So which one is it? With increasing temperature, does the drain current increase or decrease? Well, it turns out both. If we go back to the datasheet now, we have this graph. So here we can see what the drain current will be at various gate source voltages and at various temperatures. So here we have three extremes plotted, so 25 degrees, minus 55, and 125. Now, I extracted this graph and added some colors to it to make it a bit more clear. And what we can see here is that at relatively low gate source voltages, the hotter the transistor gets, the higher the drain current is. Whereas at high gate source voltages, the hotter the transistor is, the lower the drain source voltage becomes. And that is because in either region of operation, either the linear or the saturation region, we have both parameters acting, both the threshold voltage and the scale factor. But once the gate source voltage becomes very, very large, then a small variation in the threshold voltage doesn't really matter. Whereas at small gate source voltages, any variation in the threshold voltage will have a substantial impact in the drain current. Now, the point in which all these 
graphs meet, so where temperature doesn't matter, is called the zero temperature coefficient bias point. Below this, current will increase, afterwards current will decrease. So now let's see if we can actually get our transistor to decrease its current. So to get it in the second half of this graph. And for that, I got the same setup as before. The only difference is that I decreased my supply voltage so that we can drive the transistors with high gate voltages, but limit the current through them. So this transistor has a maximum drain current of 200 milliamps, and I'll try not to exceed that too much. So now if we start to increase the gate source voltage, we see that after a certain point, all of the drain currents are equal. And now if I leave it at around 7.3 volts, we have 211, 213, 212 milliamps. So now we can wait for the transistors to heat up or we can help them along a bit. And for that, I can use again my soldering iron and let's go for the middle transistor. So as it heats up, we can see that the current starts to decrease. So we started at 213 and we slowly go below 200 and so on. So even though I'm heating up the transistor quite a lot, the current doesn't change that much. Let's go back to the datasheet one more time. Now for the 2N7000 transistor, we don't get a clear sense of just how much the RDS on can spread. The datasheet only specifies a maximum value. But if we look at a different datasheet, so for example the NTD18N06, which is a power MOSFET, here we get a typical value for the RDS on and also a maximum value. So we have roughly 9 milliohms difference. And although they don't give us a minimum value, we can assume that we have a similar difference downwards. So we can expect to have a minimum RDS on of around 42 milliohms. Now the difference between 42 and 60, the extreme values, is about 43%. So now if we check just how much we would need to heat up the transistor to compensate for this RDS on difference, so we again find this drain source resistance versus junction temperature graph, we need to go from the one value, so the one that we start off with, to 43% more, so roughly around here, we see that we need to get to about 80 degrees Celsius. So we would need to heat up one transistor about 65 degrees more than the other one to have the same RDS on. And 65 degrees Celsius temperature difference between two transistors is unrealistically large. So this is a huge temperature difference. Now the point is that even though the MOSFET type transistor under large gate source voltages doesn't have the thermal runaway phenomenon that we see with the bipolar transistor, that doesn't mean that we can get identical currents between multiple transistors just by relying on this self-heating. So in conclusion, if you want to use MOSFETs as switches, then you will need to drive them with large gate source voltages, you will be in the negative temperature coefficient area, so heating it up will decrease the drain current, so you don't really need any other special mechanism to equalize currents on multiple transistors that are linked in parallel, but you won't get equal currents. So even if you would try to equalize the currents, then you would just make things worse. The point is that if you want to use multiple transistors as switches, at high currents, you'll just need to use maybe a few more than you would normally use, just to compensate for this RDS on spread. On the other hand, if you're trying to use MOSFETs in a linear amplifier application, where your gate source voltages are quite small, there you will have your positive temperature coefficient, the hotter the transistor gets, the larger the current will be, and there you will need to apply the current sharing mechanisms that we talked about for the bipolar transistors. So adding a source resistance or adding a transistor to limit the current or something a bit more complicated. It all depends on what exactly you're trying to do with your transistor. Now, speaking of MOSFETs, there's one more topic we do need to talk about. So regardless of what you're trying to do, linear amplification or switching, there's the topic of stability. It's quite easy to get the MOSFETs to oscillate. 
So to show off the phenomenon, I prepared this little circuit. So what I have here is a pulse source giving a 0 to 6 volt pulse with quite a steep transition time, so 100 nanoseconds, through a 50 ohm resistor. So whatever driver you're using, it will have some sort of output impedance, even if you don't put a special resistor for this. This is driving two N-channel MOSFETs that have a certain inductance in their drain. And then this is connected to a load resistor and to a supply. Now I'm using quite large drain inductors just to highlight the phenomenon, but regardless of how the circuit is built, you will still have some sort of inductance between the drains and your connection to the load. So if we run the circuit and we look at the voltage in the drain of one of the transistors, the one with the larger inductor, so I used two different inductors just to highlight the phenomenon. In real life, your inductors will be different because of, well, mismatches in the physical construction, but also the transistors will be slightly different, so some sort of parameter variation. But anyway, now if we look at the drain, we can see two things appearing. So on the one side we see quite a large spike going up to around 60 volts, so the inductor is large enough to damage the transistor. But we can also see this oscillation going on and on and on for quite a substantial amount of time. So you don't want the spike because it will damage the transistor, and you don't want your oscillations because these will decrease efficiency and they will radiate and cause electromagnetic noise. So how do you fix this? Well, one thing you might try is to reduce the slope of the input signal. So rather than using rise and fall times of 100 nanoseconds, we could go to a much more conservative value of 2.5 microseconds. If we look at how this circuit behaves, we can see that we did reduce our initial spike, so we're in the safe zone with the transistor, barely but we're there. But we can also see that our oscillation problem didn't really go away. So we still have this oscillation going on and on and on for quite a substantial amount of time. Now, the main cause of this oscillation lasting so long is that we inadvertently created an LC circuit by using more than one MOSFET in parallel. So on the one side we have the inductors in the drains, and on the other side we have the drain to gate capacitances. And then these are interconnected with a very low impedance trace, so there's no resistors or anything else to prevent oscillation, and we see this oscillation going on and on and on. And that's not a good thing. So another thing we can try, rather than work on the pulse shape, so to reduce the slope, is to add some gate resistors. So individual resistors for each of the transistors. So I took the initial 50 ohm resistor and left 20 ohms of it connected directly to the signal source and then the other 30 ohms I split it into two 60 ohm resistors. So the two 60 ohm resistors in parallel make 30 ohms. And if we look at what this circuit does compared to our reference, well we can see our initial spike is where we left it, so at 60 volts we did not reduce our initial spike. But if we look at the oscillations, we see that they die down much, much faster. So by adding these 120 ohms in between the two gates, we get the oscillations to get attenuated much quicker. So in the end, we can go with some sort of intermediate circuit. We can reduce the slope of the pulse by increasing the output impedance of the driver, and we can reduce the oscillations by adding gate resistors individual to each transistor. So the final version of the circuit looks something like this. I left the initial 50 ohms, and then I added an extra 50 ohm resistor to each transistor. And if we look at this, we got down to pretty acceptable levels with the initial spike, and the oscillation stops quite quickly. Now if we compare this particular circuit to the one with the slope control, we see that it works slightly better, we see the oscillations dying down faster, but if we look at the current going through the load, so this is the one with the slope control and the one with the extra resistors, if we zoom in a bit, we can see that the transistor with the slower slope has a slower transition time, so the slope is inadvertently affecting how fast the transistor is switching, whereas the one with only gate resistors has a faster switching time. So we managed to reduce oscillations, we managed to reduce the initial spike, but without compromising the switching characteristics of the transistor. 
Let's now see how this phenomenon looks like in practice. So what I got here is a board containing three transistors driven in parallel. At the moment there's no individual gate resistor, just a global 50 ohm resistor for all of the transistors. There's 10 microhenry inductors in each of the drains. And I'm driving the circuit with a 30 kilohertz square wave that passes through the second channel of the oscilloscope. And we can look at how the circuit reacts. So if I supply this from 6.5 volts, we can look at the signal after the 50 ohm resistor and we can see already some sort of oscillation going on. So we do have some noise in the gates. And if we look into one of the drains of the transistors, we see our large oscillations appearing. So the amplitude is around 25 volts. So it's not enough to damage the transistor. That's also because the input signal slope is not as abrupt as we had in our simulation. But we can see that the oscillation continues for quite a long time. Now, if we try a different type of input signal, say a triangle wave, this again goes from 0 to 5 volts just like the signal before. If we look into one of the drains of the transistor, we still get the oscillation. So regardless of the slope of the signal, you still get this oscillation appearing because of the mismatch between the transistor parameters. So now let's see what happens if we change the resistors in the gates. So now we have the same setup as before, the only difference being 50 ohm resistors added in each of the gates, other than the global 50 ohm resistor linked directly to the signal source. So now if I fire this up, again we start with the square wave signal, we look into the drain of the middle transistor, we still see our oscillation appearing, but we see that it dies out much much quicker than before. Now by adding the resistor we didn't prevent the oscillation from appearing, but we managed to make it last a little less. Of course by adding larger resistors or by decreasing the 10 microhenry inductor that I put there, we would not get such a severe problem. Now if we turn to the triangle wave, again look at the same transistor, we still see our oscillations appearing not as severe as before and again they seem to die out quicker. So we can look at all of these measurements in the stable right here. So in all cases we can see that the oscillation dies out faster by adding these resistors even though it's not that obvious that adding the resistors made the oscillation weaker. So all in all regardless of the type of circuit that you're trying to build whether it's a linear amplifier or a switching circuit having individual gate resistors for each of your MOSFETs is critical. And this will help prevent any sort of oscillations and it will make the circuit work smoother in general. So all in all, hope you got some useful information after this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be up to date with all my latest videos and see you next time. Bye bye.